God's word to you and me is found in Esther 7, 1 through chapter 8, verse 8. And uh, those of you that haven't been with us, man, you're just going to have to catch up on your own and, and uh, put it on your smartphone and listen to it or read up and catch up. But I'll, I'll try and catch you up as best I can. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. And Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we were merely... If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, An adversary, an enemy, the vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. And just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king exclaimed, "'Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house?' And as soon as the word left the king's mouth, covered Haman's face. Then Harbana, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stand behind Haman's house. He'd set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he'd set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. That same day, King Xerxes gave Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. And the king took off a signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Esther's, over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. And then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it's the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? And King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews and I have given his estate to Esther and they've impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. May God bless the reading of his word. The late Francis Schaeffer, was, uh, he was an apologist for the Christian faith, particularly in the 1960s and the 1970s. Remember, he had his retreat up in the mountains of Switzerland and young college students would go there and, and he would reason with them for the faith. They, these are people coming from atheistic and just unbelief. And, um, and so he, he wrote very helpful things, helped me keep my, keep my head on straight when I was in graduate school, very helpful to me. But anyway, he said this, he said, truth always carries with it confrontation. Truth demands confrontation, loving confrontation nevertheless. If our reflex action is always accommodation, regardless of the centrality of the truth involved, there is something wrong with us. 
And having said this, he came to this conclusion about the times that we now live in, particularly the last 50 years. He says, this is not an age in which to be a soft Christian. And they're just saying, this is not an age to play around with being a person of faith. You're either in or you're not in. You don't mess around with this stuff. He's, it, what he was saying is we live in an age where Christians are, are going to have to make difficult stands and say things that are unpopular with the rest of the culture and be ready for pushback, for people to say, you, you guys are idiots. Where do you get that from? Winston Churchill, one of my favorite uh, historical figures, was is considered the most famous English person who ever lived. He was, uh, we'll add this for the English people. He was actually half American, right? Um, but his, 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 his mom was American. But he... Um, they, they did a poll to say, who's the greatest Englishman who ever lived? They did this in the United Kingdom. And he came at the top of the list. And this was only, a, you know, a couple decades ago when they took this poll. Um, even greater than, uh, than the, uh, some of the kings of England. You'd think surely one of the great kings of England would be listed as the greatest English person who ever lived. But no, it was Winston Churchill. But it wasn't always that way, was it? Prior to World War II, the newspapers portrayed Winston Churchill as a paranoid prophet. Chicken Little saying, the sky is falling. Somebody who was an exaggerator and over the top because he thought that, that Germany was rearming and would start another war and that there was evil coming up in Nazi Germany. He, this guy is crazy to think such a thing. And of course, we look back at this in hindsight, don't we? And we know, no, he actually wasn't exaggerating, wasn't he? He saw the world for what it was. He saw evil and he called it out. He was right. And he's the one who was able to lead Great Britain to victory in its fight for its life. It's never been easy to call out evil and rebellion against God for what it is. In the book of Isaiah, remember Israel at the time had gone into serious rebellion against God. They're, they're wor worshiping the, the Baals, the Asterisks, the god and goddess of, of fertility. And they're, they're sacrificing human beings to Molech. And they are engaged in the, the most deviant kind of sexuality. They've, they've taken on, really taken on the, the Canaanite culture that's always surrounded them. And they started absorbing the evil that was around them. And God says, you've gone too far. And therefore, judgment is coming. And Isaiah, he's in the throne room of God. He's overwhelmed by the angels, the throne, the vision of God. And, and the Lord says, who will go for us to proclaim judgment and evil in the land? Who will do this? And Isaiah, here am I, send me. He responds in the moment. And then you get down another paragraph and God says, oh, by the way, no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to hear you. No one's going to see what you really mean. They are all going to be as, as dumb as doorposts. And you're going to be wasting your breath for your whole ministry. You know, if somebody had told me that when I went into ministry, oh, Greg, you're going to go out into the hills of North Carolina and uh, you're going to be up on this little hill, this little church. No one's ever going to show up. In fact, people are going to gradually leave till it's just you. And I'm, I'd like, sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. And that's the kind of ministry that Isaiah had. And he was, I mean, we were told by tradition that uh, they didn't like him so much, they put him in a hollow log and cut him in half, his own people. Not a pleasant ending for a career as a prophet. Calling out and naming evil is a fearful thing to do, yet this is exactly what Esther was going to do in today's scripture. Remember from last week, from the weeks before that, um, you know, Esther is a young Jewish girl living in the Persian Empire, which was present-day Iran and also included Iraq 
and on down into Israel and Jordan. That's how great the Persian Empire had become. And she's an exile living in, in what is present-day Iran and in, in, um, in Persia. And, uh, you know, the king needed a new queen, and then they had a beauty contest. Esther wins the prize, and she's the new queen of Persia. This is historic. This isn't a make-believe story, folks. This is historical. And um, remember that uh, her uncle Mordecai wouldn't bow down and worship the king's favorite noble, a guy named Haman. And so Haman got permission to wipe out all the Jews. He got an order for genocide in Persia. Here, king, sign this. I'm going to kill all the Jews. I'm going I'm to round them all up and put them all to death, and we're going to take their stuff. And her uncle Mordecai says, you got to go into the king. you got to risk your life by going into him uninvited, and you've got to ask him to spare our people. And she did. And uh, she walks into the throne room. The king lowers the scepter. Come on in, queen. And he likes her so much, he says, if you want half the if you want half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. And she says, oh, well, how about dinner instead? And by the way, bring this guy Haman that you like so much. Bring him to dinner too. And so the king and Haman show up. And again, the king asks what he could do for Esther. And, he, and uh, she says, come to another banquet. I love these, these Middle Eastern ways. There's kind of a buildup to it, you know, well, we, to get to the real banquet. You've got to come to the pre-banquet and then the next one. Um, in between all of this, the, you're going to have to, this is, we're doing Esther in brief, so you have homework, guys. You have to read chapter 6 on your own. In chapter 6, the king can't sleep at night. And uh, so he says, bring out the books and read me the records. And he finds out that Esther's uncle Mordecai had foiled an assassination attempt that was brought against him. And so he says, oh, well, we need to honor Mordecai. So he gets Haman to lead Mordecai through town on a horse with the royal robe. And it's kind of a pre premonition of what's going to happen next. In fact, uh, Haman's relatives say, maybe you ought to back off on this going after Mordecai business. So finally, the day of the second banquet comes around, and the king arrives with Haman. And this is where our passage begins today. I think I've caught you up a little bit. I've given you the executive summary to some degree, the cliff notes of Esther. Well, at, it's at this moment that Esther pleads with the king to save her life and the lives of her people, the Jews of Persia. And she started very plainly. I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. Doesn't get any clearer than that, wouldn't you think? I mean, she's got to be straight with this king. Don't dance around. This is exactly what's about to happen. The king is furious. He's fit to be tied. And he said, who has done this? And she said, the vile Haman has done this to me and my people. Now, I don't know about you, but my, my head, my mind kind of swims around on some of these stories. And I'm, tell me, let me know if you, afterwards, if you thought the same thing. But I'm reading this, I'm like, well, King, you signed this silly thing for Haman that wipes out the Jews. Shouldn't you have checked out to find out who they are? Or maybe that your wife is one of them? Or the guy who saved your life from assassination, he's one of these Jews that you just signed their death warrant? But I, I think Xerxes, he's, he's treated like a god in Persia, and that's in the ancient world. If you were king, you, you made yourself a god. And people worshipped you, and you acted like a god. You had the power of life and death over everybody who was in your kingdom. And I think, I think Xerxes threw away lives without a second thought. Oh, you smell bad, you're in my throne room, just take them out and just kill them. Oh, you know, we need a little more land over here, just wipe them out and let's put a vineyard in there. Or, you know what, there's too many of these kinds of people in the kingdom, just count off by three, just kill them and wipe them out. I think that's how he operated. I don't think he cared 
uh, what happened to them. Life is still like that even in the 20th century. It's a fascinating to me when we're reading all the open books from the bad old days of the Cold War. Some of you were Cold War warriors. But they've been up, able to open the books of the Soviet Union. And, the, and the, what they found is that under Joe Stalin's rule of Russia and the Soviet Union, he, a conservative estimate of the people that he put to death is about 20 million. 20 million. Can you imagine with just a, a stroke of your pen, just send them all to the gulags and work them till they're dead. And that's what he did. Never lost any sleep over it. Well, you know, 20 million, there's more where they came from. That, that was kind of his attitude. It's like, eh, what's one human being? So what? 20 million, uh, we'll get more where that came from. Adolf Hitler put to death 6 million Jews in one of the worst genocides of a race the people has ever heard. We're shocked when we saw things like what happened in Rwanda. I mean, we, we think, oh, that's horrible. I met a young man and at a youth camp. He was from Rwanda, and I said, uh, I said, why are you over here? He says, I'm an orphan. I go, what happened? He said, uh, my whole tribe was wiped out with machetes. All 500 of them. The whole village. And we're shocked by that. But we read about history and we're like, oh, you know, that was 60 years ago, right? 75, yeah. Probably the, the worst butcher of the 20th century that nobody really talks about was a guy named Mao Zedong. Probably responsible for the deaths of 40 to 60 million Chinese people. And he's... He's still under glass in the city where you can view him and worship him and whatever. But he didn't think anything of killing people. He, no big deal. In the case of Xerxes, his misguided order might have led to the death of his beautiful queen and all her people. So he's furious when he found out what Haman had done. And immediately Haman was executed on the device that he built for Mordecai. He was going to pale, more gross way to die, and pale him on a pole over 50 feet up in the air. And uh, he, you wonder, why do you need to put it up that high? You know why he put it up that high? He wanted everybody to see it. He didn't want this to be an invisible execution or a secret execution. He wanted everybody in the city to see how much he hated Mordecai and what he was going to do to people who crossed his path. And instead, he ends up on the very device that, that, that he had in store for Mordecai. And Esther and the Jews of Persia were, were given permission to defend themselves on the day that their enemies would attack them. So the salvation of the Jewish people from Haman and the Persian Empire through Esther's bravery, it's celebrated on the Jewish holiday of Purim. If you have Jewish friends, you know about Purim. They celebrate it every day. They celebrate the day 2,500 years ago when their people were saved from genocide at the hands of the Persians, the, the Iranians. How does that sound for you? And um, they read the story of Esther. And every time they, they say the name Haman, everybody goes, Boo! and they rattle pots and pans. And when they say the name Esther or Mordecai, they cheer. And it's a big party. And um, Purim is next. Next Purim is at sunset on March 23rd, the day before Palm Sunday. How about that? So next, that Saturday, you can, when the sun goes down, you can read the story of Esther and cheer on what happened back then. You know, as we wrap up this short series on the book of Esther, what stands out to me the most is the courage of Esther. Esther was not a warrior. She's not a big intellectual. She's a beautiful woman, but, but every, in, in every other sense of the word, she's, a, she's an ordinary person. She's not a politician. She's, she's just a young Jewish woman, probably in her early young adulthood, maybe 19 or 20. 
And yet, um, she's in the right place at the right time, I think, because of the Lord's movement. And she could have hidden, she could have held back, but instead she, she put herself in, in a place of danger. She mustered up courage and did what she was supposed to do, which was to, to make a stand against evil and, and to a stand to protect people who were in deep trouble. And, and I, I love that story that um, she put her life on the line to, to point the finger at evil. All the Old Testament prophets pointed out rebellion against God and the evil that was present in their day. Being a prophet had to be one of the hardest callings in the Bible. You know, I always say, Lord, I'll be, your, I'll be a pastor, I'll be a minister, I'll do whatever you want. Just don't make me a prophet. <laughs> It's being a prophet. That's tough work. It's being a prophet. It's not about telling the future. It's standing in the gap and calling out sin where there's sin and evil where there's evil and saying, no, no. That's a hard job. It takes a special person. It takes courage to do that kind of thing. Now, I don't think Jesus calls us all to be running around the town and finding fault with everyone or to to be a people are always looking for trouble. I, you know, uh, but I think when we see spiritual darkness and evil at work, we don't turn a blind eye. We don't put the blinders on and pretend it's not there. And sometimes there'll, there'll be spiritual darkness and wickedness that's entered into the public sphere. And I, I don't care if it's public or politics or whatever. You still got to call evil, evil. Some examples, one of the greatest evils in our day is how cheapened human life has become. It's become really cheap, whether it's the life of the unborn in the womb, we don't, we throw them away. Or, or the elderly, the, 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 the uh, eugenics in, in medical right now against the, it's becoming more close to me as I've turned 60. I'm more interested in what they're doing to the elderly. I, you know, it's kind of personal, right? You know, and like, oh, well, he's 60. He's lived most of his life. Just, you know, take him out back and finish it, you know? Um, I'm concerned that there's that kind of attitude in our culture. You know, we, you know, people think abortion is a big deal. I can tell you what's going to be a bigger deal real soon is what do we do with people who are in that latter part of life? And we don't seem to have compassion for basic human life. You know, we watch all the recent deaths by drug overdose or suicide and violence. And, you know, you hear, oh, well, the Chicago's doubled their murder rate. I think we're numb to it. Do you? Oh, well, so someone else died. Okay. Oh, well. And we, we've lost our compassion and we've lost our, our grief over this stuff. And then we, we've stopped saying, why, Lord, why? What can we do? Um, and we, we need to speak out and say, no, this, this isn't right. Life is precious in the eyes of the Lord. Life is valuable and should be protected. We live in a land that has become incredibly, I'll put it under the, philosophical term, we've become hedonists. I, mean, I think we've been hedonists for a while, probably since the 1980s, truly. And um, we live for uh, sexuality with abandon, whatever makes us feel good and whether, whatever way, shape, or form it comes in. We've, we, we put substances in our body to, to numb the emotional pain or to make us feel good. And, um, and we're materialistic. You know, I, I read a lot of magazines and papers like the Wall Street Journal and things like that. And it's like, you know, to get our economy going, Americans need to buy more stuff. Didn't you know that? You need to get out there and buy and purchase because it'll make you feel good. And you need more stuff, right? And so we become, we flood ourselves with material stuff. We were at this uh, conference for uh, the Congo, and it's like, okay, the average pay for 
Congo family is about $2 a day. How about that? We have no idea. But in our country, I think we've, we've become flooded with a hedonistic ideal. And we need to, it, it takes, having money, you know, having all these things isn't evil in and of itself. But I mean, if that becomes our focus, I think it takes us far away from God. And it really eats away at our soul. And, and we become small hearted. And, and so these things worry about me. And I think, I, I don't think we're called to stand on the street corners necessarily with, you know, sandwich signs and posters. But I think there has to be, here's what I think we need to do as a people is in our everyday conversations, you are going to come across people who have opinions that are kind of destructive and verge on evil and wickedness and spiritual darkness. And that's, that's your moment to speak truth. To say, you know what, I don't agree with that. I, I, th I think God has a better way for us to flourish as human beings. I, I think that's a bit dark what you're proposing. And now I, I stand for human life. No, I, I don't think consuming is the way to go. No, I, I, I think there's another way. On a very personal level, I think when we see one person committing evil against another, Christians have to stand in the gap. We had more teenagers at nine, and I said, when you see some, when you're, some of you, you're, I'd rather forget junior high and high school, frankly. I don't, I don't ever want to go back to junior high. I'm like, I'd rather, you know, jump off a cliff than do junior high again. But I remember people ripped each other to shreds and were mean and cruel. And, and in high school, people were cruel to each other. And as adults, well, I'm oh, glad I'm an adult now. No, we're just more sophisticated about it. We can do it and we know how to do it and get away with it. And I, I think, you know, on a very personal level, when you hear someone aiming cruelty at another person, you need to say, wait a minute. No, no, we're not going to talk about that person behind their back like that. No, we're not going to rip someone's reputation up with them not here to defend themselves. Or, no, I don't, I don't know that about that person, that what you're saying. That's not what I understand about them. But I think a lot of times we just shut up and we just let it go. Let it happen. Or you see some, some kind of cruelty and darkness taking place against someone at work or in your neighborhood. And what are you going to do about it? You going to let it happen? I think we need a little Esther courage, don't you? Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but in the middle of COVID, in the middle of the riots taking place back in the cities during 20 and 21, seems like seven or eight years ago, doesn't it? Like, wow, man, that was a long time ago. But it wasn't. It wasn't. It was only a few years ago. And there were, I remember seeing on some of the YouTube channels, there, there, you know, churches were shut down, police cars on fire, people beating the tar out of each other out in the streets, crime, burning up stores, stealing, all this kind of stuff. And um, in the middle of that, there's this guy named Sean Foot, And he started a movement called Let Us Worship. And he'd set up a, a um, you know, a, a platform in the middle of a park, he'd get permission, and then he'd get musicians and pastors from local churches that had been shut down. And they'd play music and he'd preach and they were doing open air baptisms and, um, you know, preaching the gospel. And you could sometimes see the fires around him and the Antifa and all kinds of nutty stuff going all around him. But he's right there in the middle of it, preaching Christ. And he's calling sin, sin and spiritual darkness, darkness. And um, he was, he didn't stop with pointing out evil, but he also said, here's the 
here's the problems in our culture right now. But he says, there's an answer to it. And I think this is where we go as Christians to say, there's evil in our culture. There's spiritual darkness. But here's the answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is the, the, the God of the universe who came down to earth to die on the cross for our sins, to, to overcome death, to give us a new beginning in life, to give us his spirit that transforms us from the inside out, and to give us a reason for living. There's a lot of people wandering around. They said this last week. They don't know why they're here. They have no idea why they're on the planet. They're just killing time. And when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you get a reason for being here and a calling in life that sets you free. It sets you free. Now, we live in the days that, unfortunately for us, I'm sorry about this, but it's going to require courage on our part to call ourselves followers of Jesus. You're going to swim against the tide. And it's, it's going to require some courage. And, and may the Lord bless you as you have some of these Esther moments, sometimes within your own family or your friend circle, or the people that you work with. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you that you love each one here. And I pray that uh, you'd call each one of us by name to, to walk with you, to speak truth, and to point people to the light that, that brings life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You've got your homework, right? Chapter 6. And there's more after this, so if you want the whole deal, you've, you've, you've got to do some reading.